you have to turn the uh, if you're I, I, I guess I should have been clear about this if you're calling us using your computer uh, and you're doing it uh, then you you have to find you have to turn the player uh, pause the player or mute the player um, uh, otherwise because there's a delay uh, in the uh, there's a delay in the um, in the broadcast so there's yeah. about 10 seconds delay. So I guess I should have been clear about that. My apologies. Sorry about that, well, Bob. Call back if you want to. Um, yeah, I was going to say, let's uh, invite him to call back. Yeah. But I want to go back to this whole thing about about the, uh, you know, how do you choose and stuff like that. And and I, look, here's here's the thing I, I will say. I, I keep on hearing people talk about how uh, the the leader has so much power and the backbenchers can't do anything and, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, and at the moment, there's a there's a lot of truth to that, in terms of the amount of power that the leaders of political parties have, but it's it's not as bad as people think it is, including, regrettably, backbench MPs who don't understand how much power they actually have. And so, you know, if if you have one or two members of parliament who uh, in a political party who decide to go against the caucus or go against the leader. Uh, what the leader wants, uh, you know, then the leader is going to have uh, going to react to that. The, the party whip is going to react to that. You're going to have a situation where, as I like to say, those those rogue MPs, the MPs that are straying off the reservation, uh, as it were, are going to have a problem. But if you have five or six or seven or eight MPs banding together, who are going to vote in a particular way that is contrary to what the leader wants them to do. Well, that's actually a caucus revolt. So you could push the leadership as well. And the leader can't kick you out of parliament. And the leader's not going to kick 10 people out of caucus, presumably. So you have a certain amount of power that you can exercise. And and, and I, when I talk to black be- backbench MPs, I remind them of this. It, you know, it, it takes a certain amount of courage and a certain amount of conviction and a willingness to stand up and speak truth to power. And if you do that, you, lo and behold, you will gain the respect of your leader and the leadership in your caucus. Uh, and uh, and if, you don't, if you don't gain their respect in a positive way, you'll gain their respect in a negative way because they'll, they'll be thinking, well, what do we have to do to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nick Vandergrat backbench MPs uh, backbench MP doesn't precipitate some sort of a revolt uh, in in his group, and you see this a lot more in the states uh, than you do in Canada, and and the reason you see it in the states more than in Canada is partly because the system allows for it more, but it's also because the members of of the individual parties are still more independently minded than ours, and they're willing to go against their party leadership from time to time. And there's nothing stopping our, our to, from doing the same thing. Now, there's another point to make on this, and that is that the leader of the party has to sign your nomination papers to allow you to run as a candidate for that party. That is an Elections Canada requirement, but that is not constitutionally required. And indeed, it's a relatively recent Recent is in not the last 10 years or so, but if memory serves me correctly, that might have been a change in the legislation that was made. Uh, I want to say the early 70s, but it may have been the early 50s. I'd have to go back and I have to research that. I used to know this stuff, but I don't know it all or I've forgotten some of it. So the point being that that's a legislative change that can be made. So here's the thing. You say, I don't have influence, but you do have influence, but you only have it if you are participating in the process. So my my response is, don't spoil your ballot. Go, take a look at your individual candidates, vote for the candidate that you think is most representative of your values uh, and what you want to see happen. Vote for that candidate irrespective of what political party they belong to, uh, and uh, and and join a political party, 
and have your say in the political party. And you'll find that you're going to have people who agree with you. But it's, you know, we, one of the problems right now in the election that we have, Nick, that's, that's going on right now is we see a fracturing in Canada uh, of the conservative vote. Now, I don't think that the uh, vote splitting is so significant that it's going to make a whole lot of difference. But, you know, we have the Christian Heritage Party. We have the People's Party under Max Bernier. We have the Conservative Party. We have the Libertarian Party. We have, uh, they're not registered, I, unfortunately, but um, they're in the process of registering. It remains to be seen whether they succeed in having that done before an actual election or while there's still enough time in the writ period to make a difference. But that is the this new political party that Derek Sloan is trying to start and trying to lead. So there are options. And then out west, there are a number of, a couple of federal parties that are more regional based. So there are, we're, we're all of these fringe parties are basically founded by people who go, I'm not satisfied with the process in the mainstream party, in our case, the conservative party. So I'm going to go off and I'm going to do my own thing. And and that certainly is their right. And, and I'm very, very sympathetic to the frustration to the, uh, uh, that, that leads to, you know, that kind of a decision. I am, but yeah, ultimately, well. ultimately, if you look at the people that stay in the party, take social conservatives, for instance. Well, social conservatives remain, if not the majority in the conservative party, they are the largest group in the conservative party. And so why not continue to organize within the party rather than having key people like Derek and some of these other people just sort of abandon the process and say, okay, uh, they don't want to play with us, so we're going to go off and start our own political party. And yes, I know that Derek was kicked out, but that doesn't stop him from being an influential force in the Conservative Party uh, and, and rallying his supporters and getting them to participate in the process. And look, it's it's politics. It's like a football game or it's like a hockey game is probably a better analogy for Canadians. You're going to win some games and you're going to lose some games. And in the middle of the game, you're going to have goals scored against you, and you're going to have goals that you can score. But winning or losing is all dependent on being in the game. So that's my answer. Okay, it's a, it's a lengthy one, perhaps. It's a, uh, uh, a you know with some twists and turns, but the bottom line is this: I don't see how you're advancing, or we as genuine principled conservatives are advancing our cause by running off and 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 basically doing everything outside of the political party when we have the numbers and the strength to continue to be influential and perhaps even to take over our, our own political parties. Understanding, well, just last point, Nick, understanding that there are going to be people in the process who are going to disagree with us and their point of view is just as valid as our point of view on these issues. And so we have to have respectful debate and we have to we have to tolerate other people's opinions. So that and so I, I just point that out because I, I believe in a big tent conservative party. I'm just saying that I believe it has to be a big tent conservative party. As long as that tent is for conservatives, um, instead of just anybody who wants to walk in the door and try to change the direction of the tiller, uh, that's always been a problem with me. But look, I I agree with you about this idea of, you know, the Derek Sloan party, the Max Bernier party, and you know all these different let's call them fringe parties, because. Look, in, in the case of Max Bernier, there's a lot he says that I have a, I, I have a lot of time for. I mean, you know, his, everything from his immigration policy to you, you name it. There's a lot that I like about Maxime Bernier. But I think both you and I would recognize, and I think most of our listeners would too, that the only person that stands a chance getting elected, certainly this time around, to the House of Commons is Max Bernier himself. 
And the same thing with Derek Sloan. If he can get that far, I'll be surprised. So all this does is, and you say it's insignificant. I'm not so sure of that, especially in the tight race. If it turns out that O'Toole and, and Trudeau, and by them, I when I use those names, those are just ac- um, names I'm using to label the parties. It's not so much the individuals, but if if the Trudeau liberals and the O'Toole conservatives are basically neck and neck, and then you've got all these four or five different conservative fringe parties, each drawing several thousand votes away, it could make the difference between whether we get a majority, minority, or throw him out altogether. So I, that's why I, I, I understand the, the frustration. I'm frustrated, too, because I'm tired of losing. And I think the, the way to win is so easily mapped out if we could just get them to pay attention. And I also take heart in the fact that your idea about having people who are so con working with other people who might not see the whole the world exactly through the same lenses as they do to cobble together some kind of internal coalition and to take over the party and steer it in the direction we would rather see it go. That I think is far more useful than it is um, to than it is to try and strike off in a new direction. I mean, Let's face it, we don't like the way the party is broke is being run right now, but in and of itself, the party is not broken. It has its grassroots, it has its writing associations, it has, you know, a whole network of people required to put a lot of people into office that the other guys simply don't have. And I don't think you should throw the baby out of the bathwater. So when I started this, it was more really out of a simple sense of frustration that these guys will not listen. And it's like sitting back next to your best friend in the car and him driving straight for a cliff and you hauling on the wheel and won't let go. He won't take any advice. He won't listen to anything you have to say to avoid the upcoming disaster. And it's frustrating because you're along for the ride. And that's what's really you know behind a lot of the um, the angst. If you hear it in my voice, that's probably what it, that, no, it's not probably, that's what it is. Because it's so easy to fix. It's so easy to fix. Just be conservative. Just don't be liberal. Start talking about cutting taxes, as you suggested earlier. Lay out a simple environmental plan. Have a plan that makes sense for the military. Talk about immigration in a way that puts Canada first. All these things are dramatically different than what we see out of Queen's Park. Not Queen's Park but out of um, uh, Parliament Hill from the red side of the chamber. And I think if you did that right, more convincing in your arguments and convicted in your arguments, you would see a huge turnaround in the fortunes of that party. Well, whether or not you're going to see a turnaround in the fortunes of the party, uh, I think is is almost secondary. That may happen. It may not happen. But if it's ever going to happen, it's only going to happen when people are participating in the process in a meaningful way. Uh, And uh, look, uh, I'm just going back to Bob when he called, uh, you know, when he was, the call was being screened. Uh, I'm just looking at the note here that I got. uh, And, uh, and the question that he wanted to talk about was, okay, fine. Uh, It's very easy to say, you know, vote for the person. Uh, who's going to do the right thing, quote unquote? And yes, that's what I said. Uh, and and the question he has was er, is, well, how could people make that choice? How do we know whether or not we're going to vote? We're voting for the right person, or the person that's going to make the do the right thing. Uh, and the answer is, look, it's politics, and in politics, there are no easy answers. There are no perfect answers, and it's it's an imperfect system. And and you're talking about people. Who are imperfect to start with. So the bottom line is this. I don't have a simple answer to that question. But I do know that you do have opportunities through an election campaign and in the lead up to the election campaign to get to know your local candidates, get to talk to them, get a set, talk to people who do know them. You know, if they have a background in business or profession or whatever, talk to people around them, look into it. I, I don't know that you're going to come up with the right answers, and you may come up with answers that you thought were right and, and ended up being dead wrong. I just.